I think that's different about us. So it, with the uh, McDonald Observatory, all the professors are still in Austin, right? They don't have to go up to the telescope if they really need to go otherwise they just tell them, you know, look at this area in this in the sky. But here we're all so our department is here. We're we're the only department in the University of Texas at Austin that's not located. Uh, faculty members are people that want to actually work in the green environment or need you know salt water in the laboratory so they can study fish or behave in the physiology or whatever. So we're, we're all here. We have mainly graduate students. We have undergraduate students this spring. So we this spring we have a semester by the sea where the graduate students come here from the region of Austin and do kind of research projects that they But anyway, I just wanted to welcome you all. Again, this is the last one. Our education uh, coordinator in the back, Adriana Meza, is here. But she has laryngitis, so I'm going to tell you where the exit doors are in the bathroom. Give <laughs> 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 you a home and get some extra rest. Anyway, so again, welcome uh, to the University of Texas Marine Science Institute. If there should be an emergency, have exit doors here and there. If you need to use the restroom, they're located just outside the store. But anyway, tonight I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Kyle Runyon. He's one of our graduate students. He's working on a PhD in marine science. He does remote sensing, which is a, you know, it's the kind of stuff I did do when I was a graduate student. Right? So now we have satellites up there that can take images of the coast. We can just do so much things on a much broader scale. And look at them that way, and then you do some, some ground truth and stuff, and so on. But anyway, uh, Kyle's one of our, our our top graduate students. He had a Davidson Fellowship from NOAA, and so he's, he's, he's done a really great job. He's going to tell you about some of his research. So, satellite based tools, detailed salt mark, mark facilities. So, Kyle. All right, Bye. thank you. So thank you everyone for coming. I'm really excited to talk about my dissertation research. Uh, again, it's titled Salt, uh, Satellite Based Tools to Detail Salt Marsh Resilience. Um, and right off the top, I want to thank um, my co-authors, some faculty here and elsewhere that have been you know, super important in, in getting a lot of this work done. So just to orient all of us to begin with, you know, salt marshes are these really unique, really cool environments that occur at the interface between the land and the sea. So as I'm standing in the marsh taking this picture, you know, I'm looking out at the sunset that's uh, rising over the coastal forest here. And then behind me would be, you know, the open water, either a tidal creek or an actual bay or estuary. Uh, so these environments, you know, they, they're really narrowly banded by what's important, elevation, because we're thinking about, you know, elevation in the upland being higher. And then as we reach the subtidal area, What's happening in these marshes is really that you know they're being intersected by these creeks and the tide is constantly coming in. So there are these really dynamic environments that are constantly being inundated, being incised by these tidal creeks. Uh, they have these flooding conditions where, particularly on uh, the east coast, where there are these sem semi diurnal uh, flooding tides, where these marshes are getting two high tides and two low tides throughout the day. So each of these spots are getting wet and dry and wet and dry in really short time frames. So there's so much going on in these, you know, they can look very peaceful when you are standing in a marsh and looking out, um, but they're changing really rapidly. And for that reason, they can host a ton of different biodiversity. So these are all pictures of critters that I've come across uh, in doing my field work in the marsh. Some of them I was a little less excited to come across than others. Uh, but because of these really dynamic conditions, you know, there's a huge range of species that utilize these marshes. Uh, so all of these listed here, and not only to mention, you know, the culturally and commercially important species, like we had the whooping crane festival because those cranes are coming to stop at our marshes. Uh, some of the fisheries here really rely on these salt marshes as nursery grounds. So these are part of, you know, a bigger ecosystem that are really contributing to a lot of the ecosystem services that we rely on. Another ecosystem service they provide is a buffering pollution. So as we have, you know, runoff coming from up the land, uh, these a lot of that water can enter these uh, salt marshes and wetlands where these plants are uptaking a lot of those excess nutrients. That's going to lead to improved water quality 
so we can you know, better make use of our coastal areas. Another ecosystem service they provide is carbon sequestration. So when I talk about salt marshes, a lot of what I'm really talking about is the vegetation. And like any other plant, uh, when these salt marsh grasses are photosynthesizing, you know, they're taking in carbon and they're developing these really dense root structures. So a lot of this below ground biomass. But what's different about salt marshes compared to some other environments is that because they're, they're inundated uh, you know, so frequently, oftentimes these soils are being filled with water and this ox the oxygen in these soils is driven down. So we're getting these uh, anoxic environments where this organic matter that the salt marshes are creating through their root structure is not decomposing so much. So we're getting this organic matter accumulation and that can lead to you know, the marsh evolving and vertically building. So as it's creating more and more below ground biomass, the marsh structure can evolve and rise. And that's one of the ways that uh, these marshes can be resilient to sea level rise. So when I mentioned sea level rise, that's one of the main things that we're worried about when these salt marshes, you know, they're really vulnerable ecosystems. As I mentioned, they exist at these narrow elevation bands and the vegetation can be really sensitive to flooding. So a little bit of flooding pressure is great for these grasses because they're adapted to grow in environments like that. So, uh, incoming flooding water is bringing in nutrients and things like that. But, um, you know, we can have this maximum productivity at some narrow range of intermediate flooding. If you get too little or too much flooding, that's when the salt marsh productivity or really the vegetative health is going to decline. So this is really a concern when we think about ongoing sea level rise. It can lead to areas like this, where this is a marsh in coastal Georgia, where, you know, I'm standing in the middle of the marsh, and all of a sudden there's just this big area where all I see is dead stems. Essentially, a lot of that live vegetation has died back, and that's what we call these areas, uh, marsh dieback. We think a lot of this is due to excessive flooding. So sea level rise is this really pervasive threat uh, and can lead to these marshes drowning. Uh, and all of those ecosystem services that I mentioned that these marshes are providing can be lost when these transition to open water environments. So coastal managers, when they're thinking about uh, conserving all of the services that these salt marshes provide, they'll ask these questions. What are salt marsh resources like? It's not so easy just look at a marsh and you know, understand how productive it's being. It's really difficult to get out there and actually answer that question. How do we assess resilience of these marshes across the landscape? And then when we start to learn some of these things, do our knowledge and do our tools transfer? If we learn something about marshes on the East Coast, does that apply to Gulf of Mexico marshes? Uh, does that knowledge you know, cross species? Does it transfer there? Um, so there's a lot of questions that these coastal managers are trying to ask. When they're thinking about resilience of salt marshes, the productivity of the vegetation plays into this a lot. It can be just put briefly that marshes must outpace sea level rise to persist. And when I say outpace, I'm really talking about this marsh platform elevation change in this diagram here. Ultimately, that just needs to be at least equal to or greater than sea level rise. And below ground biomass is really what's driving that marsh platform elevation change. As I mentioned, these marshes are growing these really dense root structures. Uh, the more of that they grow and the more they can persist in growing all of that, um, a lot of that organic matter accumulates, drives the vertical platform of the marsh upwards and allows it to stay uh, near that maximum productivity when you're thinking about flooding pressure versus elevation. So we can think about below ground biomass as the strong proxy of resilience. The question then becomes, how do we assess below ground biomass across the landscape? That's kind of asking where are the marshes resilient? And then on the other hand, where might they need some intervention or some restoration? There are a couple problems with trying to answer this question. The first one being that monitoring of this, you know, this metric is really effort intensive. This takes a lot of time and energy and effort uh, going out into the marsh and collecting soil cores bringing those back into the lab, washing away all of the mud, and then separating out live versus dead roots. This takes a lot of time, effort, money, all of that stuff. And this is problematic because then, you know, we're getting one data point each time we do that. And the productivity of these salt marshes varies a lot over space and time. So here we're looking at uh, the above ground biomass, obviously. This is a drone imagery of a Spartina alterniflora marsh in coastal Georgia. 
but you can see just how much even the above ground stuff is changing. So we have this, this tidal creek uh, running through the marsh and these smaller incised tidal creeks. You can see by the creek on the right side of the image there, there's this uh, bright green. It's this really tall vegetation. And just inside, the color changes a little bit. That vegetation actually gets a little bit shorter. As you move further and further into the interior of the marsh, you start to see actually the density of the stems is declining. So over these really short distances, what the marsh vegetation looks like and its productivity ultimately can be really different. It can also change a lot over time. So we understand the typical sort of seasonal progression of how this vegetation is growing um, through the winter senescence and the summer, the growing season and whatnot, um, but it can also change a lot year to year. So even though it takes, you know, it takes all of this effort just to get one measurement of the low ground biomass, it can be very different across short distances. And even if you take out you know, the seasonal component, it can be very different year to year. So because we have you know, these two big problems up against this pretty critical piece of information that we really need about these salt marshes, a solution to these problems is to use ecosystem models. So these allow us to estimate the ecological conditions across the landscape and through time. And so an example of an output of an ecosystem model is shown here, where we're looking at um, this heat map is showing change in below ground biomass over a five year period in a marsh in coastal Georgia. And some quick takeaways from this map, we're gonna see that these warm areas are depicting gains in below ground biomass. So those are the areas that we might look at this map and say, those are probably more resilient. On the other hand, these cool areas depict losses in below ground biomass. So the takeaway there is that those are the areas that we might wanna be targeting for some intervention or restoration in order to make sure that these marshes persist as sea levels are rising. So when I see the term ecosystem models, uh, it just kind of sounds like a black box to me. Like it's this computer-based sort of tool, it's this model, but that's not really descriptive of what it's actually doing. So I'm gonna walk through first just how we build and then how we apply ecosystem models. So first to build these models, you know, we, we've got to go out and get a ton of ground truth field data. So we're measuring whatever metric of interest is that later we, you know, we want to describe, we want to predict or estimate. Um, this is titled the model calibration. So for this, you know, our metric of interest is below ground biomass. And we want to do this in a wide range of conditions. Because remember, this can change so much across short distances and short time periods. So capturing this range of variation as we're doing this model calibration is gonna help us build these strong, robust models to make sure that the relationships that we're developing in this model calibration, we're not extrapolating when we're later making predictions. And then we want to do just that, develop those relationships between you know, that metric of interest or below ground biomass. And then we wanna pick out some predictor metrics. These are things that might be related to below ground biomass that could potentially drive changes in it. Um, but more importantly, there are things that are we can measure a lot more easily. So for example, in an ecosystem model, you, uh, trying to predict below ground biomass, for predictor metrics, we might use the above ground biomass. You know, we can directly see that, it's a lot easier to measure. Then we can also apply these other things like satellite, tide, and climate data. And then the final step for really applying these models is just to flip these arrows around. So then we're using those predictor metrics to make novel estimates. So those are then places, you know, places we've never set foot and times that we're never out in the marsh. We can still assess what below ground biomass is like and get some measure of salt marsh resilience. So with that intro out of the way, here are the three objectives that I'm gonna talk, uh, that are gonna drive the remainder of the talk. The first is to evaluate how salt marsh below ground biomass varies across time and space. And we're gonna keep an eye towards all of this model building because uh, that's a really important component in thinking about capturing all of that variation. Then we're gonna develop and apply some ecosystem models in order to be able to predict below ground biomass and ultimately characterize resilience of these salt marshes. And these first two objectives, um, these are building off long-term projects that had started in coastal Georgia. So a lot of that work is gonna be taking place there, but being here at UTMSI in the Texas Coastal Bend, um, I'm really interested about you know, bringing those, those tools here. So that's what the third objective is gonna be, all local work, um, where I'm thinking about transferring those tools 
um, both to a new region here in the Texas Coastal Bend and also to new species. So in this first objective, just thinking about how below ground biomass might vary over space and time. This is essentially asking the question, does it vary more across short distances or among consecutive years? And thinking about how this variation sort of presents itself in this metric can really help us think about what's driving changes in below ground biomass and also uh, you know, what might be important to include in modeling frameworks. So this conceptual diagram can help us think about variation a little bit. We're on the top, we're looking at a metric you know, that's similar among sites and time. It does not vary very much. Meanwhile, on the bottom left here, we might have a metric that is similar among sites, so it's pretty consistent across the landscape, but it's changing, and it's changing consistently among those sites. Alternatively, we might have a metric you know, that's really stable uh, among time, but it's really distinct among different sites. Or you know, what probably is happening a lot more in the ecosystems is that it might be similar among neither. Some sites might be really consistent, and some might change through time. And again, this is really helping us identify whether that model calibration, as I mentioned, you know, we're putting so much effort into this, should we focus on more sites or more years for our data collection to help build more robust uh, and better performing models? So in order to answer this question, we went out and measured a bunch of below ground biomass. Um, I took, I don't know how many of those cores, near a thousand. Um, I also measured a lot of the above ground plant metrics alongside those below ground biomass cores. Um, that's with an eye towards this modeling later for us scaling all of that up. We did all of this in coastal Georgia. So this was in partnership with the Georgia Coastal Ecosystems LTER. That's the Long-Term Ecological Research Project. Uh, most of these sites were concentrated around Sapelo Island, as you can see here, but there are a few spread throughout the coast. Uh, and we measured all these metrics at nine different sites and we did it for at least two consecutive years. So I went out and collected all these metrics for two consecutive years, uh, but on the map here, those sampling sites with an X depict uh, long-term sampling sites through the LTER. So that's really leveraging a bigger project to try to get more out of this. And all of these sites were in the same salt marsh grass species, Spartina alterniflora. The common name for that is smooth cordgrass. Um, so we have this species here in Texas as well. And so first, what I'm going to show you uh, is distribution of all of those measurements. Essentially, what I did here is uh, I binned observed below ground biomass, and then I just have the count how many measurements that I made fell within that bin of below ground biomass. Essentially, just what we're looking here is at the shape of the distribution. And I just introduced this because we're going to be you know, grouping out all of these measurements by site and by year to try to look at how those compare. So this is, uh, these are density plots, essentially what I was just showing, looking at that shape of the distribution, and we have site groupings on the left and year groupings on the right. Essentially, similar shapes here represent similar distributions of these measurements of below ground biomass. So you can take a look at this and start to get a little glimpse of spatial versus temporal variation, um, but we can also do this analysis statistically. So that's what I'm showing now here on the bottom. Um, with this, these matrices showing a pairwise comparison. So each site is compared against each site. Each year is compared against each year. Ultimately, if you just follow over one of those groupings to a match there, if you see a shaded box or, or asterisks there, that depicts a significant difference. So ultimately, these pale colors will represent more similar below ground biomass measurements, and these darker colors represent more different. A quick takeaway just from you know, you can look at these and take this away almost instantly that the sites overall are being more distinct than the years. One site is more likely to get you a wider range of variation uh, compared to if you were adding more and more years of data collection. So this is leading us to our first key finding that below ground biomass varies more across sites than it does among years. In other words, it's more spatially variable than temporally. But now that we know that, you know, this is super variable across different sites. Another question we might ask is, well, what ecosystem attributes, maybe some of those predictor metrics, might help us capture that variation and better describe it? This kind of gets us into two trains of thought here. Uh, the first being, well, which ecosystem attributes could help us better predict below ground biomass? Or on the right, you know, which potentially drive changes in it? So first, 
On the left here, we're asking the question of essentially what is happening out on the marsh. This is more the phenomenological understanding. On the right side, we're asking you know, a sort of a different question, why is this happening, more the mechanistic understanding. So for me, when I'm trying to build accurate prediction models, mostly what I'm interested in is that what is happening model. So we're gonna focus a little bit more on that. And when I think about you know, what ecosystem attributes help us capture this variation, I can group some of these things into these four broad categories. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list just all of the variables that I considered as potential predictors of below ground biomass. So in the biological category, these are all things that I measured alongside below ground biomass when I was out taking those soil cores. Uh, we have the actual amount of above ground biomass. We have a few metrics about the composition, so the leaf chlorophyll and nitrogen, and then an index titled leaf area index, essentially how much cover is there per unit area. For our climate variables, these were all gathered from weather stations. Uh, we have some pretty basic you know, temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, and vapor pressure. Then we also modeled the date of green up. So essentially, we used a temp soil temperature-based model to estimate when did the growing season start. Was it earlier or later this year? For our hydrologic variables, we're gathering a lot of these uh, variables from tide stations. We're thinking about the flooding frequency. We actually also incorporate a remote sensing-based model that, is, that just looks at the marsh uh, over a 10-year period and is you know, classifying dry or flooded and taking some average percent, you know, some frequency, how often is this marsh flooding? And we also have an inundation and dry intensity that are describing uh, how much or how little water has been on the marsh. And for physical, we have elevation, which we also uh, went out and measured with our soil cores. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to plot each of those variables and just present them all the same, just like this. Each of those variables is gonna be on the x-axis with below ground biomass on the y-axis. So in each of these plots, there are going to be a lot of gray dots. That's really just all of the data that I'm plotting here. But what we're gonna be looking at is the trend line. And we're gonna be looking for some strong or distinct trends between these two variables. It, because if below ground biomass is co-varying with this ecosystem attribute, it might be a strong predictor later on. So here's what these biological variables look like. Again, just all of those gray dots are all of the data. So we went out and collected a ton of data for this. Um, and we can start to see a few gentle sort of trends here. For example, when we see um, in above ground biomass, we can see a maximum amount of below ground biomass uh, at like a pretty low actually amount. So this is describing some really interesting plant growth patterns that we can dig into a little bit later. Um, basically, what I'm looking for here is just some type of trend because the machine learning algorithm that I'm gonna throw all of these into can kind of sort all of the specifics out later. So here, what I'm looking at is the climate variables. And again, just looking for a trend where it, what I don't see a trend in is the precipitation, solar radiation, and vapor pressure. So we're gonna go ahead and cross those out. Those are not explaining any variation, essentially, in below ground biomass. For our hydrologic variables, now we're starting to see some really distinct trends. Uh, and ultimately, what each of these are showing, the flooding frequency, inundation, and dry intensity, are showing some maximum amount of below ground biomass at a pretty low, not at the minimum of each of these variables or the maximum for the dry, which is just essentially the opposite, um, but at a relatively low value. So lower, but not the lowest, uh, essentially water cover is where we see the maximum amount of below ground biomass. And then we see a really distinct trend with elevation as well, where we have the lowest below ground biomass at low elevations, higher at highest elevations, and then a peak really in the middle there. So essentially, each of these variables were showing some variation. They co-varied a bit with below ground biomass. So they all might serve as strong predictors. So we're gonna consider each of these in our modeling framework. And again, that modeling framework is just taking that metric of interest uh, and really developing these relationships with all of these predictor uh, metrics. And these are the categories that each of those sources of data sort of fit into. The source for our, again, our below ground biomass is all of that data that I just presented, that field data collection. For our above ground biomass metrics, we also collected that data. Then for satellite data, we're using Landsat 8 and 9. Those are US government publicly available satellite data. We're using NOAA tide gauges, and then we're using a system of weather stations for our climate data. Now these three represent 
like big data. Essentially, we have these widespread and we have really long record data records of these. Um, so we can essentially get these anywhere we want that we might predict below ground biomass. The field data collection, on the other hand, that's not big data, right? I went out and collected all of that. So since we don't have that widespread data, just an intermediate sort of step in this process is that we're going to create prediction models for all of those above ground biomass metrics. And you know, since we can actually see the above ground biomass, we can make a simpler model. We're just gonna use satellite data for those. So all of this is a developed and published suite of models, really. It's titled the Below Ground Ecosystem Resiliency Model, the set of prediction models that use machine learning algorithms to be able really just to find those relationships. That's what we're interested in. Uh, and the first step of once we build and once I have updated uh, this modeling framework is to evaluate the model performance. So all of that calibration data um, that I had shown with the below ground and above ground biomass measurements, what we're gonna do is we're gonna split that into training and testing data sets. And those are just exactly what they sound like. So the um, training data is being used to build and to train this model. And then we're gonna reserve the testing data. So the model's not trained on this, but then essentially what we can do is we have the true measurement, you know, what we went out and measured, and we're gonna use the model to make a prediction there. And then we're just gonna compare those. So that's just what this looks like. We're on this plot. I have the observed below ground biomass on the Y and the predicted below ground biomass on the X. Essentially, just any point that falls along this one-to-one -one line represents an accurate prediction. And so here are what all of that testing data looks like, where these are color-coded by uh, different sites that we visited. But ultimately, what we're seeing uh, is that the model predictions were, in fact, highly correlated with our measurements of below-ground biomass. And there are a number of different error metrics that we can apply to sort of describe this performance. Uh, a normalized one that gives us a percent error rate is giving us an error rate of less than 10%. So we're pretty happy with the performance of this model. Uh, jumping back to our first key finding that below ground biomass varies more across sites than does among years. Well, our calibration data included these nine really distinct sites. So we think that that helped us capture a wide range of on the ground conditions to build this robust model. So that's just you know, our, key our first key finding for this objective um, that we can make these accurate predictions, but it's this machine learning model. It's a bit of a black box. We can do a little bit of uh, post hoc sort of analysis to figure out how is it making these predictions. Essentially asking the question of what predictor metrics did our model select and which predictor metrics were really influential in making accurate predictions. So we can do that and ask and answer this question by looking at this metric called feature importance. It's an output of this modeling framework. And essentially what I've done here is just summarize those by those four categories that I presented earlier. So the width of these bars is just showing the summed feature importance. Uh, ultimately, you know, we're just looking at which categories were most influential in predicting below ground biomass, and we find that the hydrologic variables were in fact the most important. Uh, but in our, modeling, uh, in our modeling workflow, we included different lags, different time integrated averages of each of those predictor variables. So here is what the model actually looks like. It's a little more complicated. Um, you don't have to worry about what all of those variables are, um, but just know that you know, each category of those variables is represented. So each of those different categories is telling us something about the amount of below ground biomass, kind of indicating you know, how complex of an ecosystem metric it can be. We also see that information from up to five months previous is influential in making predictions. So this can also be a really slow variable to respond to ecosystem stress. So our second key finding um, in, in this objective was that you know, each of those categories uh, was influential in predicting below ground biomass, but those hydrologic, those essentially flooding and water-based metrics were the most influential. So building this model is cool, but really applying it is you know, why we do this. So I'm gonna go walk through a model application. This is the Duplin River watershed in coastal Georgia. Um, it is entirely contained within Sapelo Island, so it's right by where we collected all of these data. There are about 14 square kilometers of Spartina alterniflora cover. This is about 16,000 pixels of satellite data, and that winds up being almost 2 million predictions that I'm gonna be presenting here. Again, we're just taking this model that we've built, we're flipping around those arrows and using those relationships to make a prediction. Uh, here, I'm just showing 
a map of the watershed for a little bit of context. And then here are our predictions, where this animation is running through five months every second. You can see uh, with the sort of heat bar here, the color gradient, those very green areas are higher predictions of below ground biomass, and these pale areas are very low predictions. And what we can see in a few different spots here um, is these sort of interior marshes, which happen to be lower elevation. Um, we're seeing a lot of this really pale colors. So we're starting to find that these low-lying interior marshes are having the lowest below ground biomass. And we can, we can do more than just look at an animation. You know, we can actually plot these data. We're here, I've uh, binned all of these predictions by elevation, and we're looking at those against predicted below ground biomass. The size of the dot just represents how many times that happened. Um, in this animation here. And we can see sort of a similar relationship, which we might expect as our field data, where we have this low predicted below ground biomass at low elevations. And as you reach about mean high water there, we're hitting a maximum prediction of uh, below ground biomass. We can also look at this, you know, not just spatially, we can look at it temporally. So we can look at trends in below ground biomass, and we're seeing slow declines year after year. There is some variation there, but the ultimate trend that we're seeing in the past decade is a decline. So this is worrisome when we're thinking about uh, resilience to sea level rise. And this trend is not isolated to this one specific watershed. Um, this is the entire Georgia coast, where I've made predictions of below ground biomass in all of the Spartina alterniflora cover that's present there. It is over 750 million locations. So that's winding up with about 900 million predictions, or 90 million predictions. Um, and you can see just this red color depicts reductions over time. Uh, so we're losing below ground biomass along the entire Georgia coast. So this is really troubling in thinking about long-term salt marsh resilience. So all of that for the Georgia coast, um, this, all of that data and those models were on this one species on the east coast there, um, Spartina alterniflora. But here in the Texas coastal bend, where I'm gonna start to bring it back home, you know, we have the same species. We also have a little more diversity in our salt marshes here, partially because of the lower tidal range. Um, but we also, so in the low marsh, we have this species, uh, desert saltgrass is the common name, or Disticulus spicata. So then my question becomes, is this model that we built on this one species in this one region, is it transferable, essentially, to a new region and a new species? So we can ask and answer that question by collecting a lot more of essentially that testing data in the calibration data set, um, collect this new calibration data, and then apply the model and see what its performance is like, see essentially how accurate it is in predicting uh, this metric here. So the, uh, the calibration data that I collected uh, first was in Bayside, Texas, where there are these really distinct separate communities of these two species of Spartina and Disticulus. So these are growing in monocultures. Um, you can kind of even see on the map here, uh, if the color comes out enough, um, this sort of purple is the Spartina alterniflora down here, and this a little bit greener is the Disticulus. So these are growing totally separately, which kind of makes our modeling job a little bit easier. On the other hand, here in Port Aransas, Texas, I also collected data at the birding center. Uh, where we have these really sort of mixed species communities. So these two species are both growing there, but they're co-occurring and sort of growing right next to each other. So by you know, doing this test model application here in Texas, we're looking at the effect of a new region, a new species, and then a new community structure here, when we're looking at this mixed species communities at the birding center. And essentially what we're doing then is when we have all of these different types of you know, this calibration data that we want to model, we're testing the assumption that the relationship that we had built in Georgia on this one species, uh, testing if that's applicable here on these different species and whatnot. So testing essentially, are those arrows uh, you know, still valid here? So I'm gonna be presenting, um, just revealing uh, parts of this plot here where we're looking at model prediction error uh, for these different sort of groupings of the model uh, uh, application and data that we're testing. So on the y-axis here is model prediction error. You don't need to know what the numbers mean. Um, just know that a shorter bar represents more accurate predictions. And each of these bars will be color-coded for our species cover. So this is the Georgia map. Uh, and this color is a little hard to see, but it um, corresponds to Spartina alterniflora. And kind of as you might be able to predict, you know, we developed the model there to apply there. So the performance is 
pretty good compared um, to what I'm going to be showing. We have this really low model prediction error. When we think about this same species, Spartina alterniflora, but now here in the Texas coastal bend, the model error does increase. It jumps up. Uh, to put a little context behind what these numbers actually mean, that's not sort of a, uh, an egregious model error. It's still performing OK, but it's definitely, you know, the model wasn't calibrated here, uh, so the performance is not quite as good. When we think about uh, a different species here in the Texas coastal bend now, Disticula spicata, again, the error jumps up a little bit more, uh, but it's still at some adequate sort of level. But where this model really does fall apart is when we consider that community structure. So when we're thinking about these mixed species communities of both Spartina and Disticulus, whether it's uh, each of these species are now sort of living on their environmental range, or it could be the competition between the two, there's something that's happening that's changing the plant growth patterns to the point to where our model is really no longer applicable here. So the error just jumps up um, and it's not really, um, not really suitable for application in these mixed communities species. So our key finding number three was that the model was somewhat transferable across regions, particularly with that same species. And um, this is telling us that region-specific calibration can be very helpful, but species-specific calibration is pretty essential. So to wrap all of this up, um, you know, we understand that salt marshes are these really valuable, yet really vulnerable ecosystems. Below-ground biomass can be a key indicator of resilience, but it is not easy to measure, and it changes a lot over short distances. To overcome that, you know, we've developed these tools to accurately predict below-ground biomass, and they're showing a lot of vulnerability, particularly at these low-lying interior sort of marshes. These models are moderately transferable across regions, um, but not so much across species. And with that, I'd like to thank all of my um, funding sources and partners for this project. My contact info is up here if you have any questions later on, but I'm also happy to take questions now. I've been working here for just over three years. So I started at the beginning of 2021 alongside being a graduate student, so taking classes and doing this research. The number of soil cores I calculated one day because I it was a bad idea to look at that actual number. Um, it was, you know, it's something around like the 800 range. Um, which each of those can take up to two or three hours for processing. Um, so it, you know, just that below ground biomass data takes a long time to collect. So I will say the Texas coastal bend has one of the highest relative sea level rise rates. So the relative sea level rise, that's also taking into account land subsidence. Uh, when you extract things like fossil fuels from the ground, that's going to cause the land to sink. Um, so we do have a really high rate of relative sea level rise here. Um, the interactions, particularly with sea level rise, is also different because um, the tidal range, you know, is so low here. We have these tides that are, instead of being two meters or around six feet on the east coast, you know, they're on the magnitude of tens of centimeters, and they're a lot of times mostly driven by meteorological effects, so winds and precipitation and things like that. Um, so that's changing sort of the pattern of flooding. Um, but a lot of these marshes are also, because they have that such low tidal range, they're really devoid of any sort of elevation change. So they're really flat. So that can be really concerning when we're thinking about a high rate of sea level rise and pretty flat spatial topography. So the graph you had that showed the accuracy of the model's prediction, I noticed that it got less accurate, it seemed, the more biomass there was. Do you mm. know what's going on with that? Is I there know. simply not enough data? or That can be one thing. You're starting to reach sort of the bounds. Um, 
and it's more difficult to predict when there's more variation. Um, particularly this uh, yellow color here, flux A, that is a lot of these high ones. Mm -hmm. um, there's just this really sort of particular peculiarity about the data where, so what we do to measure below ground biomass is we take the soil core, right? We also measure the uh, corresponding above ground biomass. And then we actually take another step to scale that up to a sort of plot level. So we're measuring the amount of above ground biomass and taking a measurement of essentially a calculation then of how much below ground biomass is there. So there's this sort of edge case scenario uh, at all of these points right here that are really driving up the model error where just the stem density was very different between the plot and the core. Um, so there are a few things uh, that it's hard to get around because I don't want to just exclude data because it looks bad. Um, but I do see some, some reasons of why maybe it's so hard to predict at that level uh, because some of some of the field sort of um, peculiarities. Any more questions from anybody? All right, we got one over there. Yeah, so I'm not directly measuring soil salinity, but one of the things that I can do once I make these predictions is start to um, at least look at sort of watershed level salinity and compare, comparing that to some of the trends. So for example, when I'm looking at like that watershed level uh, Georgia trends of below ground biomass, um, I just worked up that figure today, so I haven't gotten there yet, but that is something that I wanna do, uh, compare that to salinity and it's really interesting because you know that's also changing so much and it's so different in the poor water compared to in the open water where we have a lot more measurements. Um, so that's something that might be difficult to tease, a, tease apart if it's a subtle relationship, um, but I'm hoping to find some, some broader trends that can help us hopefully tell us something about the relationship between salinity and the below ground biomass. Okay, got one more. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so particularly looking, I guess, down here, down south um, in that watershed. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's definitely concerning to see this sort of widespread trend. Um, I will say, you know, we worked really hard to try to get this robust model that captured a lot of that variation. Um, there is still some potential for, you know, the further we we collected all this data around the Sapelo River, Doughboy Sound, Altima. Uh, river. Um, so the further we get away from that, the more there are sort of relationships that we might be lean, leaning towards extrapolating. Um, so I want to do a little more analysis on that. Um, I also, to put some context to this, um, some of these watersheds have a lot more cover of this species. So for some of these, even a, you know, a gentler decline is still worrisome because there's so much area. Um, and you can also sort of see it's, it's really these like inland um, watersheds that are, those are the only ones that are actually gaining. Um, so that could be something of, it could start to look at marsh migration, it could look at, you know, sea level rise is then kind of pushing them on that productivity versus flooding sort of parabola, it could be pushing them more towards the productive side. Um, it's difficult to say sort of at this early stage, but overall, yeah, really, really disheartening trend that we're starting to find. Okay, any more questions? All right, well, Kyle Runyon, thank you so much. Just give Kyle a hand. Yeah, thank you. We here at MSI would like to thank all of you for coming out for our public lecture series. This is the final one for the year, and uh, we enjoyed your company, and please come back next year. Thank you. <laughs>